Hello, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to all of you. Our very special guest tonight is Paul Hellier. Hello, Mr. Hellier. Hello. Very nice to have you here at Exopolitics Hungary. I'm. It's my pleasure, Bella. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm really honored to have you here. I think it's an honor of a lifetime. And I have many questions, and we only have an hour. And I hope we. We have a wonderful discussion now. Uh, my first question is basically, you're 91, and I wonder what is your secret for your good health, because I think that's a lesson for everyone. And we well, could finish the conversation with this, but I wanted to start with this. Well, actually, I eat very well. I eat um, lots of uh, fruit and vegetables, and um, I have a glass of milk every day at noon. Uh, along with my uh, sandwich and fruit, and um, I don't overdo things, I'm moderate, and uh, I guess I was born with good genes, which is most important, mm -hmm. but the other thing, and the, uh, probably the final thing I could uh, mention in this regard is that I swim for exercise, I swim laps three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and uh, this is good exercise, and I think uh, if I hadn't done that, probably I wouldn't be around to be so active now uh, that uh, I'm able to do. Yes, and it's so it's... important what you do for humanity, and very few people make it for this age and be so active and clear in mind. Well, I'm, I'm blessed, very blessed, because I'm still working, and uh, I work all five or five and a half days a week, and sometimes even in the evening, so that uh, I'm very I'm very busy, as you know, and yeah. uh, just uh, keep going because I believe there are such important issues in the world and that somebody has to uh, address them. A lot of people are, but I have to add my voice as well. Yes, and I'm really glad to hear your videos on your book, The Money Mafia, because um, I, I graduated as, uh, as, an, as an economist, and I was at the viewpoint that ETs are far away, I let them alone, they leave me alone, and since then I am doing an interview with you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm into complementary currencies, which is an exotic uh, niche in the financial area. Okay. And, I've, and I've read a lot into this uh, whole financial conspiracy. And... Um, I wonder what uh, people's feedback has been as of yet to you about your book, The Money Mafia. Well, actually, the, re the uh, response has been very positive. I've had uh, many hundreds of emails from people all over who, uh, who like it and uh, are recommending it to their friends. And this is, uh, this is good news. I guess the bad news is that um, the mainline media, which is controlled by what I call in my book the cabal, yes. Of yes. the people who are really running the United States and the Western world. Uh, they don't give it any publicity because they don't want that information made available to the public. Yes. So the, the best way to do that is just to make sure that it doesn't get in your paper or on your uh, television screen. Yes, and in your Sofico interview, Sophie Shevardnadze asked you many great questions, and and one of the one of your answers to the questions was that uh, scientists don't talk about this uh, ETs and both the financial uh, conspiracy, I guess, because they just don't have the information, they don't take the time to delve into it, and I also believe that. One of the reasons is that they would get ridiculed. Well, I think uh, <clears throat> nobody likes to be ridiculed. Yeah. And always the first uh, person uh, who comes out with a uh, with a theory is um, is subject to ridicule. And often at the end of my speeches, I I talk about uh, uh, I guess uh, I don't know if he was Hungarian. Uh, Emil Semmelweis. Was he Hungarian? I think maybe he was. And he was working at, uh, at a Vienna hospital in the, uh, at the, near the end of the 18th century. 
he was concerned about the number of women who were dying from childbed fever. Yes. And yes. so he, uh, he wrote a paper and showed it to his uh, colleagues. And they were incensed because they said, here you are, we are university graduates, and you are insulting our intelligence with your simple solutions. And they drummed him out of the hospital and uh, took away his right to practice. And uh, the, it is said that he infected himself with the virus later on and, uh, and died uh, at his own hand. Well, I always assure my, pre my uh, audiences that I have no intention of doing that, regardless of what they think of my theories. But it was more than 10 years before Pasteur and, uh, and Dr. Lister authenticated what Semmelweis had written about uh, more than a decade earlier, and that was simply that the doctors were not washing their hands, going from cadavers to live patients and from one live patient to another. So it, it, I understand that the reluctance, but it's, it's also, I think, a, a very a bad uh, reflection, a serious reflection on people, whether they be, whether they be scientists, or doctors, or whoever they may be, were not willing to take time off to try and educate themselves on other possibilities, because yes. that's, that's something we all have to do. Yes, and Stephen Greer, in one of his videos, which I gave a URL, URL to, it's tinyurl.com slash Stephen Greer CIA document, it's a YouTube video, and in it he states and he shows the paper that in the 1950s a CIA document was published which ordered all the media and all the Hollywood uh, directors to have a psychological warfare against ETs. But on the other hand, if they were hostile, we would know about that already. And, and, and some people, like Stephen Greer, say that all ETs are positive. Some people, like David Icke, say that all ETs are negative. And you are somewhat in the middle. You say that around, most of them, around 80% could be or should, might be positive, benevolent. And the rest of them might be either, either neutral or a very few percentage negative. Yes, my, my guess would be, and no one really knows for sure, but my guess would be that of the species that have visited Earth, that most are benevolent, uh, and uh, it is the minority that who have, uh, have designs on our planet and who are uh, trying to steer our leaders in ways that are not in the uh, interests of the, uh, of the people of this planet. So I, I think the, the number of species that are, are actively negative are very small, but I suspect that maybe one of them may be uh, in working in, in uh, conjunction with, uh, with the United States government. And this is, I guess, one of the things that worries me. Yes, and um, there was a very good movie. It's called Thrive. And in it, they talk very much about this issue, well, to a certain extent, at least. And it's, 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 it's awesome that we have a long history with it. These Actually, they have been here from the beginning, as Bob Dean says. And Bob Dean had a NATO top secret clearance, a cosmic top secret clearance. And he states that, um, you know that we have the pyramid on the dollar, on the one dollar bill. And at the top of the pyramid, there's the eye. And that the universe works very similarly, just that it works in a positive way, that bad guys are limited in what they can do and the good guys are always stronger and and because the bad the malevolent ETs also have free will they are allowed to a certain degree to do what they want to do but only to a certain degree and the agenda the ultimate agenda is not theirs it is the benevolent agenda yes i i hope that is so that is my belief that ultimately what we call light and right will prevail it's just that we've been going through, I would say, 50 or 60 years of where just about every policy that has been put into effect by the leaders in the Western world has been negative against the people, and the people themselves have uh, have stopped uh, 
following the, the way that God would have them, the Creator would have them go, and instead they have made uh, money, their God, and uh, that they have uh, power and greed and money are the driving forces that have been responsible for most uh, Western development in the last uh, uh, several decades and certainly since World War II, and that this is going in the wrong way and that uh, some terrible crimes have been committed uh, by uh, people who should have known better but who are under the influence of, uh, of uh, high-ranking members of the cabal. And uh, they, they have got us into a terrible mess in the world. They're destabilizing one country after another and making life miserable for ordinary people. And that uh, somehow this has to be... Uh, this has to be rectified, has to be changed. And uh, so uh, I'm hoping that uh, there are the good people, and there are a lot of them, more all the time, I think, that the good people uh, will prevail and that, uh, that they will start building what I call the kingdom of God on earth, where every child would have uh, food to eat and, uh, and potable water to drink and, and a roof over his or her head and a and a shirt on his or her back, a little basic education and a little basic health care so that they can determine their potential and their their, their natural gifts to, uh, to help uh, other members of the world to have a better planet. So this is the, the image, the, the thing that I would like to see us go to from this era of uh, me first and me only and let the that uh, the other people worry about themselves, which is a very selfish uh, approach and which has had you know, really bad, disastrous uh, results in the division of income between rich countries and poor countries and rich people and poor people within those countries. Yes, and um, there, there's an author, a professor, he's called Bernard Lietauer. It's written as Bernard Lietauer, and he teaches in the US, he also teaches in France at Sorbonne. He was the father of EQ, the former uh, currency before the Euro, and he worked as a central banker, as a hedge fund manager, and then he turned completely and has become the advocate for complementary currencies. And he writes pretty much about the spiritual effect of money. And he stated that in one of his books, which is titled New Money for a New World, it's available on Amazon, and in it he states that this war economy that we now have trend, uh, started in the, at the end of the Central Middle Ages, uh, which it was the, the, the Dark Middle Ages was a result of this uh, this change, this shift, and before that there was pretty much welfare in Europe, and because people use different currencies for different um, activities, but once kings decided that they want more war, they decided that they want a central currency, a monopoly over the money in the country, and, and this is what we still have today, and um, it, it only causes disaster. And there was pretty much welfare in, the, in Egypt, in the ancient Egypt, before the Romans went in. And when the Romans went in, they decided to introduce their own type of currency, which had uh, basically the features that our modern currencies have in a modern way. And and, and look at Egypt. So it's, it's not that prosperous country anymore since then. And, and this secret of complementary currencies that a few authors, including Bernard Lietar, write about, I guess, is a bigger secret, a bigger taboo than UFOs, because there are so many websites and information on UFOs, but so, many, so few people are interested in, in, in how money actually works. And very, very few, very few understand. I have been saying maybe one percent or two percent are all who really understand what money is and where it comes from. 
and consequently, uh, they're so busy uh, trying to balance their budgets and pay their mortgages and uh, put food on the table that they have no time to listen or to read, even more important, because reading is necessary if you're going to, uh, to absorb new ideas. And I remember one of the quotes that uh, Alan Dulles, who had been helpful in, in smuggling some uh, Nazis into the United States at the end of World War II, was asked how easy it was to, to get away with that or why they could get away with it without uh, more opposition. And he said it's because Americans don't read. Well, I don't know if that's true or not, but I think maybe there's an element of truth in it. And they're more unlikely, more likely to get their news from, uh, from CNN or Fox News uh, than they are from reading books about the things that uh, have, uh, have been done and are being done that they should know about and that they don't really know about. So that's the reason I've been promoting uh, my book. I said, if you're interested in the future of your country, if you're concerned about the future of your country or if you're concerned about the future of the world, then uh, get a copy of my book and, and read it and find out what the issues are. And also, there is a long list of, uh, of proposed uh, of remedies of things that have to be done to uh, to turn the, the situation around before humankind destroys itself completely. Yes, yes. Stephen Greer always says that this whole extraterrestrial issue is basically about energy and uh, advanced propulsion systems like anti-gravity, quantum vacuum, zero-point energy and consciousness interfering technologies and, and this is where this whole issue of extraterrestrials and money comes together because this petrodollar system has two pillars the financial pillar and the energy pillar and both would collapse if this extraterrestrial issue was adequately dealt with. Well I don't know that I agree with that. I'm not sure that it has to. In my book for example I have a, a, a transition into a system where um, uh, individual governments <clears throat> reclaim their right to create money. Certainly the Canadian government uh, did that from uh, 1939 to 1974. We, uh, <clears throat> we used the Bank of Canada positively to create money to get us out of the depression and uh, through the war and then uh, into the post-war period to build the Trans-Canada Highway, the the St. Lawrence Seaway and the great new airport terminals, and also to lay the foundation for one of the best social security systems in the world at the time. And uh, it worked perfectly. But then, for some reason, um, the governor of the Bank of Canada agreed to, uh, to get together with other governors of central banks uh, under the supervision of the Bank for International Settlements in Zurich, Switzerland, which as I'm sure you know, is really dominated by the cabal, by the, by the banking cartel. Yes. And yes. it's been downhill ever since. And we have to reverse that <clears throat> and to take back the right to create some of our own money. And I have, uh, in my book, proposed a transitional system whereby, central gov whereby uh, governments like Canada and the United States and Britain would, and others would uh, start creating significant amounts of, uh, of government-created debt-free money and put it in, into circulation to rescue the system and to provide jobs for the people who are unemployed, the billions of people who are unemployed. And, uh, and then more important, I think, or well, not more important, but equally important, is taking away the vast power of the people who have the, mon the monopoly to create money at the present time. Because because they have a monopoly, <clears throat> they, can, they can run all the countries. They decide on the, the uh, level of growth and uh, the level of unemployment. And these are things that decisions that should be made by people that we elect and that we have accountable to us. But they have managed somehow uh, over the years, and especially since Milton Friedman's ideas came out in the 1970s, to, uh, to get a monopoly and, uh, and to take away, well, not to take away our rights because we still have our rights, but to exercise our rights 
as licensees and to try and brainwash us to believe that they are the, their rights and they can maintain the monopoly indefinitely. And as long as we go along with that, uh, that lie, which it is, uh, we're going to be in trouble. But if we go in the other direction, over a period of seven years, we could change the system completely so that all governments would be able to balance their budgets at the federal level and the state or provincial level and at the municipal level, and then at reasonable levels of taxation, lower than now. And uh, the, the leverage of the banks, which is just grand larceny, uh, which is now about 20 to 1, uh, would be reduced to 2 to 1, and that the governments would create 34% of the money and that would be enough for their purposes uh, without uh, having to, uh, to have exorbitant taxes. So what it's designed to work in a transitional way, way that doesn't uh, upset everything that is already in the system and, uh, and to uh, work in the, in the opposite directions, taking away the power from the cartel and giving the power back to the people which is where it belongs. Yes, and another part of the solution could also be that people print their own money, or at least digitally print it, because this artificial scarcity that we have is imposed by uh, the fact that money is issued centrally, and it's par centralizing and par concentrating with its positive interest rate, and it's negligating the importance of resilience because it strives for absolute efficiency. But unless we have zero or negative interest rate, which is called demurrage in finance, we will still have the same system. So that's one of the problems with Bitcoin, for example, that many, uh, many people adore now that in many points it uh, repeats the, the mistakes of the system we have currently. Exactly, um, because it's, it's, just a, uh, <clears throat> it's just a virtual money. And Bernard Lietar uh, talks and writes a lot about this, and he has enormous background. He's very credible, and he's very to the point in what he says. And excuse me, when I switch topics, it, it might seem random, but I always have a look at the clock here, and I have many questions, and I would like mm, to, to mention as many topics as we can in a meaningful way. I, I wanted to ask you what your opinion is about the, Marsh, about the Mars whistleblowers. We have many whistleblowers who came forward, like, and let me just tell the audience a few names. Andrew D. Beshago, William Brad Stillings, Bernard Mendez, which is not his real name, Michael Roth, Art Arthur Neumann, Laura Magdalene Eisenhower, and most recently Randy Kramer. And they came forward through Alfred Weber of exopolitics.com, and Randy Kramer came forward through Michael Sala through exopolitics.org. And I wonder what your opinion or experience is with this Mars phenomena they talk about. You're talking about the alleged uh, base on Mars? Yes, indeed. And, and yes. this uh, time-space teleportation program uh, that yep. Andrew Beshago talks about. And the possibility that the U.S. has a shuttle yeah. from to, uh, to Mars? Yes, and even a secret space... Uh, fleet with yes. hundreds of years more advanced technologies than we have ever seen in movies. Yes, I, I think these, uh, these allegations have to be taken seriously. <clears throat> I don't think they can be uh, dismissed uh, out of hand because uh, Ms. Eisenhower, for example, had nothing to, to gain by saying that she had been asked to, uh, to go to Mars and uh, and the others have nothing to gain by exposing the truth about uh, the um, U.S. development in, this, in the area of space travel. And uh, I also pay attention when uh, Ben Rich, for example, who was head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, <clears throat> advised his former classmates that 
we now have the uh, the technology to take ET home. Yes, I have a picture with him, a photo, on which these uh, words are written. It's on the main website, Exopolitics Hungary. And he said that we already have the means to travel among the stars, but these technologies are locked up in black projects, and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity. Anything you can imagine, we already know how to do. Yes, well, I, I don't go quite as far as saying anything you can imagine, because I, I think there are things we can't even imagine <laughs> yes. that are possible. Yes. And yes. So uh, I, I have always, uh, in my previous book, which was called Light at the End of the Tunnel, and which is still in print, and a lot of people are buying as sort of a, a stepping stone to uh, the, the present uh, money mafia, <clears throat> I said... Uh, I didn't know how much I didn't know because I didn't know how much there was to know. Well, that's still true of me and I think of every human being, that we can just keep on learning every day if we open our minds uh, to new ideas. And, of course, it helps a little bit uh, if we have some time to do some reading and, uh, and studying and uh, don't spend all of our time traveling and, uh, and just uh, doing the things that we have to do sometimes when we're selling books. Yes, and there was this Edgar Mitchell who had his samadhi in the space shuttle when they came back. And since then he, he, he was studying this experience that he realized was to be called a samadhi, according to ancient uh, Vedic texts. And also Stephen Greer points to the importance of spirituality because uh, many benevolent E.T. races claim that that would be the most important part of our current development. We have some sort of technology we back engineered. We have uh, we have many advancements, but but still the most important thing in the universe is spiritual evolution, isn't that? Yes, I agree with that. And um, the uh, postscript to my book um, is on that subject. I say the missing link is spirituality. And if you look at the major religions, the five or six major religions, they all have something in common. And that is some version of the golden rule, which is to do to other people what you would want them to do to you. And if we observe this, nearly all of the problems in the world could be, could be solved. If we were just as concerned about the poor and dying who who have no food and, uh, and no water, as we were about ourselves, uh, we would share. And we would stop spending so much money for uh, weapons and space travel and divert uh, enough of it. And it wouldn't even have to be all, just uh, maybe a fraction of the United States expenditures on, uh, on armaments would be enough to end poverty on a worldwide basis. So there the, the possibilities are endless, but it requires spiritual people to take the leadership, <clears throat> to show the way, and to put the golden rule into operation. In and one of, my, one of my fondest dreams is that, uh, that President Barack Obama, uh, in his last uh, two years in office, uh, when he has nothing to lose, would... Uh, would start a spiritual and moral revolution where we change our priorities, where we reduce um, our dependence on armaments, cut them drastically, cut back the CIA drastically because it is a menace uh, to the world and has been and remains, and uh, starts diverting that, uh, that money to, uh, to creating the, the kingdom of God on earth. So this is a, it's a dream. Not impossible, but he has to break loose of the the uh, influence of the cabal, which he is certainly still in the in the grip of, in my opinion, and which has been responsible for some of his very bad decisions. That they just, uh, in effect, uh, say this is what we want done, and uh, and uh, expect you to do it. Yes, the U.S. presidents have an an enormous responsibility at. And Alfred Weber had very interesting articles on 
Barack Obama, as we call him, if he is truly him. And I also wanted to mention um, David Wilcock wrote a lot about this Satanist cabal, the, this religion, if we can call it that, that they have. And it is initiated by malevolent ETs. It has been for millennia. And in his show on Gaiam TV slash David Wilcock and on his website divinecosmos.com, he writes a lot about this uh, negative aspect of the cabal and how we can recognize their subliminal education in movies and and in Olympic openings, etc. So we have all the resources now to, to for disclosure, to do disclosure for ourselves, to not be misled. And we have all the technologies. There is this harp. And, and it could be used for greening deserts. It could be used for, you know, decreasing storms, which they are currently doing or have been doing in Japan, for example. And um, we also have several other technologies like seawater desalination. And they talk about that we don't have enough water to drink, but that's not true. This planet is water, two-thirds of it. So we just have to use seawater desalination plants as Israel and Australia and most of the Saudi countries use, or Arabian countries use in that area. So we have all the technologies, and we even have the money because money is just a signal currently. It's, we have as much as we want. We can declare any uh, any backing for that, either God or human labor or time or anything else. It's basically just you know, money is an agreement, as Bernard Litar puts it. And, and so we have all the technologies. It's really just our consciousness that is, hang, that is left behind. Yes, I, I agree with you. And we have all that we need to do right and to save the planet. But... Every day I read articles about uh, oil and new drilling in the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico or the Beaufort Sea and new plants uh, until the last few days at least in, uh, in the tar sands in Alberta. And as if the oil industry is going to go on for decades. And uh, one of the things I make in my points I make in my book is that we have to look at it as if our house is on fire, which it is. And um, I am recommending there that uh, set a seven-year deadline to replace the fuel supply uh, in every car, uh, tractor, truck, uh, airplane, and home on Earth with a new uh, zero-point energy uh, box to, uh, to power it. And uh, people say, well, this, you know, it's too fast and it would be disruptive. Well, first of all, I don't think it's too fast. Ten years ago when I wrote The Light at the End of the Tunnel, I said we have ten years. Now I say uh, that we have seven years, and even that is a, is a very conservative estimate uh, as to whether or not it's too late. But we should, uh, we should do it, and we should, we should replicate what we did in World War II. In World War II, uh, which I remember very well because of my age, we took every uh, car manufacturer and every manufacturer of, uh, of uh, refrigerators and stoves and converted them into armaments manufacturers. Well, today all we have to do is the opposite and take all of the, uh, the manufacturers of uh, drones and, uh, and smart bombs and convert them into uh, factories to produce uh, zero-point energy boxes. And uh, if the technology was given to the world, which it should be, because the Americans owe the world big time, if the technology was given to the world free and made available all around the world, and the 
and the big powers and the small powers and the rich powers and the and the poor powers all cooperated in doing this job. They could do it in seven years, which would create a miracle. And it's that kind of cooperation that um, that I think we really have to uh, have to do. And it's but it might. It, as you see, it requires a mindset. It requires a change in, in our consciousness from going down the path of uh, the evil way of power, greed, and uh, money, and uh, going in the opposite direction toward uh, evolution of a, a higher consciousness and, uh, and a greater connection with the rest of the cosmos. Indeed, and in the movie Sirius, uh, Stephen Greer and Omar Deep Kalika mention Tom Burden, Thomas Burden, and John Badini, they, they deal with Energy from the Vacuum. That is their website, energyfromthevacuum.com. And Tom Burden came from the army, and he dealt with this subject that shouldn't exist, according to modern science. And, and there are so many, so many thousands of researchers in this free energy field. And I interviewed... Uh, Sterling Allen from PassWiki.com, it's the oldest news site on free energy, it is 13 years old. At least Sterling Allen has been dealing with the topic for 13 years. And he said that not even once in the 13 years has he ever met someone who has a really working machine and that he or she would have been willing <laughs> to give for the people either for free or for money. And he said that one of the reasons is human greed because inventors have put 30, 40 years into their research and, and they want something back, they want something for their grandchildren. And, and the other thing, the second thing is uh, the lack of money, so it's not the most important thing. And the least important thing is the cabal knocking on your door and saying like they said to Tesla that, okay, we have your papers now. And um, it's amazing that these scientists who deal with free energy, uh, most of them are not willing to recognize that humanity is in its last hours well, as, as, compar as compared to where we have our direction now. But he also said, Sterling Allen, that um, it's probably that, that extraterrestrials who are spiritual and or the spiritual realm don't allow us to have this technology yet because we don't have the consciousness. That is what he said. And I doubt very much that that is the case. I think, uh, <clears throat> I think the problem is our own people and their connections and their their greed and just uh, keeping the uh, technology locked up and while they cash in their their oil chips and this sort of thing they just do not care about the future of the planet the people and uh, so you know uh, Michael Wolf said in a radio interview years and years ago I think 10 or 15 years ago <clears throat> that in uh, the uh, black operations, they had developed both cold fusion and zero-point energy. And he, at that time, they'd had it for some time. So uh, it, it exists. And I think uh, you referred to a, a, a video that you have, which uh, talks about the, uh, the excursion to Zeta Reticuli, where one of the first things that happened was that they went in and found a little box that produced all of the energy for the building, and they just had to uh, to plug into it. So, the the in my opinion, the technology exists, and I think it's just a, a red herring, as we call it, <clears throat> to say that it will be too disruptive. Of course, it will be disruptive, just the way World War II was disruptive, and a lot of people had to uh, to adjust to the new situation, but the, the net effect would be that there would be more jobs available and uh, that things would uh, work in a positive way rather than a negative way. 
So the only difference is that more people would be working in, to, uh, to protect the planet and uh, to preserve it and to improve it, and the fewer people working to destroy it and, uh, and to create this uh, continuous uh, number of unnecessary wars that are being deliberately started up to, uh, to cause trouble. Indeed. I wonder <laughs> what you have as an opinion on the One People's Public Trust. The leader of that is a lawyer, Heather Ann Tutsi Yarof. She lives in Morocco now and she claims to have been an employee, a lawyer of the World Bank, IBRD. And he, uh, she wrote this One People's Public Trust set of documents that is extremely heavy uh, law text. And It, 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 it is about the American law and how it truly should work and how it is in effect in reality. And, and, and some people have very good opinions on it and, and there are even success stories of how people reclaimed their financial liberty with the, the use of this. Uh, she claims that this is uh, what she wrote only applies to the U.S. because um, every country has a different regulation in connection with the UCC, the Uniform Commercial Code, that her work is based upon. But, but still it brings great hope uh, as to the legal terms uh, in our bondage. And I wonder what your opinion is, if any, on this One People's Public Trust, OPPT. I'm afraid that I have to plead ignorance on that. I'm not familiar with it, so I can't comment on it. But I, I can say the United States has a unique problem which only it can fix, and that is the Federal Reserve System. And what happened, of course, 101 years ago, was that when the Congress was, uh, or congressmen were more interested in sugar plum fairies at Christmas time than they were in attending to their business, they let uh, this piece of legislation go through, which in effect transferred the power of the people of the United States to create their own money <clears throat> to a group of the, a small, very small group of the most powerful, richest, and most ruthless and uncaring bankers in the world. And this, this was a terrible tragedy. It should never have happened. It wasn't long after when the people who were responsible for it recognized what a mistake it had been made. But 101 years have gone by and it still hasn't been corrected. And I can say that there will be no peace on earth and no real, no real justice on earth until the Fed has been taken over by the United States government, by the United States people, and a, and a, a new central bank of the United States established in its place so that they can do what we in Canada have uh, theor theoretically the power to do. It was a terrible uh, deception. It was, uh, it was one of the biggest mistakes the United States ever made, and it's responsible for entire debt. They wouldn't have any of the $16 trillion dollars debt today if it hadn't been for the Fed. And, uh, and they wouldn't be spending their time in Congress arguing whether or not they should increase the debt level by another trillion because uh, there would be no debt and they wouldn't have to spend their time on that. They spend their time on, on uh, health care and, uh, and education and why so many people are in jail and why their, their drugs... Uh, coming in from outside the, uh, the country uh, with the aid of the of elements of the United States government. Uh, still a, a ridiculous, ironic situation where they have a war against drugs, but they're in the drug dealing business in a fantastically large way. So what we have to do is to, uh, to get them to act, to take back the mistakes of the past, and certainly the Fed, and also... Uh, to reduce the power of the CIA and get it out of the, uh, the drug business and, 
and just maybe bring it down to a very small group who were doing what they were originally intended to do, which was collect intelligence and just pass it along. Uh, although intelligence becomes increasingly <clears throat> less important mm -hmm. if the world is working together, if the countries are all working together and you don't have to spy on everybody to find out what they're doing because everyone would know what they're doing and they're all doing good things instead of bad things. And uh, intelligence agencies, as they presently exist, would become increasingly uh, irrelevant. Indeed. I wonder whether you have uh, heard about the Bank of England uh, publishing a document called Money Creation in the Modern Economy. I gave it a URL that is easily rememberable. It's tinyurl.com slash BOA, like the Bank of England, BOA Confession. It's on the Bank of England website and in that the central bankers in the Bank of England state that all that is taught in universities about how money works is a lie. And they state that from the central bank. And and this was... When did this happen? Is this recent or an older 2014. document? 2014. 2000, right, it's yeah, current. Absolutely. I will send it to you. If you would, I would appreciate it very much because that is the truth. And that's what I'm looking for. And it would be very helpful to uh, to have that document at the present time in my my almost crusade, along with others in Canada, <laughs> to stop okay. the, uh, the ratification of the Canadian-European oh, Trade yes. Agreement, oh, yes. because it would have the effect of changing our Constitution unilaterally to take away from the Parliament of Canada its exclusive rights over money and banking, which are so mm -hmm. important to us, and which served us so well in the last century, and could serve us uh, well again now. And uh, if the CETA, as we call it, the, the European Union uh, Trade Agreement is ratified, then we'll be, we'll be stuck with this uh, system of, uh, of slavery, debt slavery, uh, for generations to come. And uh, it's, it's just so important, but nobody really realizes that because, it, as we said earlier, so very few people understand how the system works and the importance of governments having, retaining and using their power over money creation for the benefit of the people. So it, uh, I, w I would love to I have that uh, document. Money creation in the yeah. modern economy. And, and it is cultural creatives who have to, who have to change this world because, because um, you know, the odd, the odd dog doesn't bark in a new way. Sometimes they say that. I don't know the professional translation for that. You can't, you can't treat an old dog. Yeah. Can't teach yeah. an old dog yeah. new tricks. And, <laughs> and I interviewed Mary Rodwell, who is a hypnotherapist, uh, and. Also, she also, or both she, both uh, Barbara Lamb uh, state, even Dolores Cannon state that there are types of children who are born in these decades to Earth that have a different DNA than, than people who were born 50 years or 60, 70 years ago. And, and these children have, in many cases, special capabilities. And she, Mary Rod, uh, has DNA results of these children. And they, they truly have a different DNA. And they are sometimes much more telepathic. They are sometimes, um, can go through walls, that is the very extreme. But, but, for example, they can write languages, they can even pronounce, that are extraterrestrial languages. And, and a, a child on the other side of the planet performs the same, independently from each other. So, there is evidence that there are unique children being born down to Earth. And Dolores Cannon wrote a book on this, she passed on recently. The book is titled The Three Waves of Volunteers. And, and, and it's amazing what future we will have. If nothing changes at all, which will not be the case, but hypothetically, but only that these children are being born 
that itself will change the course of humanity to the better. Well, there, there are um, experiments going on, as you know, that have been going on since the early 1930s of uh, creating hybrid children. And uh, I'm not just sure whether this is a, a report of the same uh, phenomenon well, or not. this is not because <laughs> these are naturally born children to natural average families. But yes, there are hybrids. I have a collection of books that are about this. It's tinyurl.com slash exophenotypes. And there's a book from Mary Rodwell, from Barbara Lamb, and a book uh, through Alfred Weber of exopolitics.com, who interviewed a person who had many encounters. And, and so, yes, there are hybrids, but it has been going on for decades and even hundreds of years. And, and Barbara Lamp states that it works in a way that they, you know, as, as if you had a garden and you were, uh, I don't know the right word, as if you were uh, purifying, hybridizing a rose so that you have a rose with a nicer smell, better smell, nicer leaves. And the same is done to these homo sapiens sapiens and, and to their species. And, and, and my belief is that they already have eaten from the fruit of uh, life, which is our DNA, and now we have a positive karma towards or in a position to extraterrestrials because many of them already hybridized or started the hybridization of their races because many of them suffer from DNA damage. And, and now they have to give us something back because we, we passively, but we save their races, so they have to save us. And, and it's a lot of them that, this, that have this karma towards us. So I think we are in a, in a very good position. That's very interesting. And, and, and no one talks about this. I am the only one speaking about this now. And, and I came to this from Barbara Lamb's um, presentations. Uh, I wonder whether you have ever been to a CE5 group, because Stephen Greer started uh, Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind, CE5 and Costa Macreas uh, started it as a global uh, movement. He started etletstalk.org, and um, he is still doing that. Uh, he also started ufocontact.com, but now he shifted back to etletstalk.org. He has iOS and Android applications. I tell this to the listeners. And, and the C5 movement is uh, pretty much effective and efficient. Is Barbara Lamb the, the same Barbara Lamb that, that she, um, <clears throat> uh, was she a presenter at uh, Michael Sala's yes. um, court? Yeah. Yeah. And I met yeah. her, I met her there. Yes, she has a beautiful <laughs> sound. It's as pleasing as the sound of Bob Dean. I really like her. And, 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 and so few people have taken part in C5 meditations from these high-ranking whistleblowers like you and so many others, like those on projectcamelot.com or, or other people. But, uh, but it's really amazing that these people from outer space take the time, of course there is no time for them, take the time to get in contact with us if we want to. And every month there is a day, a global C5 meditation day, which is an opportunity for you listeners to, to, to have a real experience with it. And there's a protocol for how to, to, how to do this. And, and, I, and, I wonder, and, and, I, and I wonder whether you, Mr. Hellier, Will will be interested in participating in such an event. I really can't uh, give you the answer to that, but as I said before, I have an open mind, and uh, I, I don't rule anything out. I don't rule anything in, because uh, I'm not the master of my own <laughs> fate. <laughs> but uh, I, I certainly uh, I'm not one who who uh, 
says, well, that's not, you know, right. it's <laughs> negative when I don't know the facts. I, I, I wanted to ask something, something from your citizen hearing on disclosure speech. You, you stated there, I would say about 95-98% full disclosure. I know of one of or two things I am not sure should be in the public domain, at least yet. It will be someday, I am sure, but not maybe immediately. So you stated that you are for full disclosure, 95-98% full disclosure. And I wonder what that 5 to 2% could be. And I wonder whether it is about the origin of religions that it is created Jesus and other such people, or, it, or is it about something else? No, it's about something else. And when do you think that uh, time could come that you could disclose that? Well, I, th I, think, uh, I think maybe in uh, five or ten years, if they started full disclosure, that it would, uh, it would, be, it would come naturally. But I think it, it, it should come at the end of the disclosure process, which is going to be a long process because there's so much to disclose. Start if you go back uh, just to 1947, for example, and disclose everything that's happened since then. It will take uh, decades, months, decades. years to, to go through all of the things that have been done, the illegal things, and, and to get the, uh, the word out. And uh, as you know, uh, several people have uh, suggested uh, providing protection, uh, an amnesty for the whistleblowers so that they will be encouraged to tell the truth. And uh, even then, just to go through the process is going to take a long time. And probably by the end of that process, the one or two things that I wouldn't disclose now would be, uh, would be you know, Okay to disclose, it, but you don't start with them. You start with the uh, with the, the beginning. beginning. Yeah, you, know, you go back to yes, the beginning. There is this Stephen Bassett in Washington D.C. with his CitizenHearing.org, and and he has just managed to give the Blu-ray DVDs to all the MPs in in the White House, and and I hope that it will start some great things because. Many people know about it. It's just that they are afraid to talk about it because they would be sacked off from their job. And I wonder how will you save your knowledge? Because if it will be decades later, I wonder what what your plans are to save your knowledge about that five to two percent. Well, it's not for me to disclose. It's for people that have the facts. Disclose the the, the papers to. Uh, to substantiate the uh, the things that I'm referring to, and uh, so it will not be for me to do that uh, because I'm uh, I'm uh, I'm the one that's asking for disclosure, not the this one who is disclosing. Do you have just as a short question? Do you have any idea what types of people these people should be from the black uh, from the black operations or from the army or from the secret services or from the government or maybe from other nations? Well, there, there are people involved uh, from most of those organizations. Uh, some of them know what uh, the things that I'm talking about and uh, the majority would not yet. So uh, it's, it's a, you know, it's a long process. And it has to start and if it needs uh, amnesty except for the worst crimes, why well, more power to them. But it's, it's not going to be easy because what we learned in Washington was those six people who acted uh, the part of the panel and uh, who all changed their minds in, six, in five days took five full days of testimony before they believed. When they came there, they were all skeptics. They didn't know that UFOs existed. They didn't know that they'd been helping to fund them to the tune of trillions of dollars over the last 50 years, and they didn't have any clue as to what was going on. So it, it's a big job of getting the word out, and uh, the time to start is right away. Okay. What would be your message to those people who listen to this interview or 
uh, read the text version of it and who are at the very, very beginning and who are young. Because my audience is young people who will be the future decision makers. And uh, I wonder what your hopeful message could be for these young people, what their uh, focus could be or what their mission could be. It would be that they have the power to change the world if they use it. And one of the, the brightest things that I can report is that a lot of my mail is from young people, as young as 15, 16, 17, 18. And they're interested, they're spiritual in nature, and they want to change the world. And I just say, go for it. You can do it. You're the only people that can do it because they, you're your seniors have mucked it up and made a mess of it, and they're not the ones that are going to rescue it. So uh, you take them on for size, and you do your thing, and uh, you rescue the world, and it will be to your advantage and, uh, and that of your children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure. You too.